Hallelujah, the Lord is good. Hallelujah, thank you. Hallelujah, hallelujah. Well, welcome, welcome, welcome. This is the first Sunday in September. Hallelujah, we're almost to the first day of fall, almost the beginning of fall. I know it didn't feel like fall out there, but but uh, we're we're almost there. Well, praise God. The, the year is uh, just about behind us, and it's been a it's been a uh, it's been a fascinating year. And uh, you know. You know, we, we talk about the tools in the New Testament. Actually, we have our, our website called GiveMeAYear.net, which uh, we're having to revamp because uh, we lost a lot of the, uh, the videos and things that were on there, different subjects. But basically, it's the, the subject is are the different tools in the New Testament. You know, that the New Testament is filled with these tools that we were given by God that through the, you know, through the writers of the New Testament. They gave us these tools that were supposed to allow us to be able to obtain the presence of God, to obtain the promises of God, to be able to walk in and to receive the fullness of the promises of God. And that's what the what what the tools were for. They were were to use it. And we've likened them to uh, like a, a carpenter, for example, who's got a tool belt, you know. And uh, he, a carpenter, if you've ever seen a, a master carpenter, he's got this belt and he's got tools all around the belt. And, but the one that is right here is his hammer because that's the one he uses the most and that's the one he learned how to use the most. And that's the one that he's the best at using. He's got others back in here that he knows he's gonna need, that he's gonna need those tools, but he's, he doesn't use them as often. So he's not quite as accomplished at, at, at that. And um, but the but the hammer is the one that he uses there the the most, and you know then probably in some sort of a descending order you know the the importance of, of the tools and so forth. And I will tell you that you know that of all the tools, faith is the number one. Faith is the hammer. Faith is the number one tool. Now technically, faith needs to be hammered in. What happens is that in order for faith to work, you have to take the promise. There has to be a promise. What it is, is it's a promise that works. It's not faith working. Faith makes the promise work. It's the promise working. And you know, you know, I think back when I was a, 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 you know, a child, if my dad made a promise, you know, my dad said, well, we're, you know, we're gonna go get ice cream tonight, you know, for example. Well, you'd hold him to that promise, you know, because he's, that's what he said. He said, this is what we were gonna do. And there was never any question from that. And, you know, being a father of six children myself, the same thing happened to every one of my children, that, that the deal was, if there was a promise, they held you to the promise. You, 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 you know, you weren't going to get out of it. And so the idea is it's the promise that works. It's the promises of God. And, and we're told that uh, faith establishes the promises. That's Romans chapter 3, uh, verse 31. It, what it says is that faith establishes the law. But the law and the promises are exactly the same thing. They are the same, they're just called by different names. So the idea is faith is what establishes the promises or makes the promise work. So it's the promise you wanna have working for you. Let's take healing, for example. If you need healing of, of anything, there's a promise that he bore your sicknesses and carried your diseases and by your stripe, by his stripes, ye were healed. Psalm 107.20 says he sent his word and he healed you and delivered you from all destruction. So those are promises, but it is faith that establishes the promise. It's faith that makes the promise work. So faith is like the hammer, that you hammer on the promise with your faith so that it, it works, so that you receive the object of your faith, so that you receive the object of the promise. And, but I'll tell you, so, so faith is probably the most important hammer, uh, a most important tool in, in the Christian's uh, tool belt. But the second one is repentance. And, you know, in most of the churches in America, we don't talk about repentance, you know, because it's not, a, uh, it's not really a, a, a subject that we like. It's not fun. There's nothing fun about repenting, you know. But the reality is that until... When you don't see something correctly or you 
have seen it correctly, but you didn't approach it correctly, the only way to change the direction of that thing is through repentance. And what repentance basically means is repentance is that I saw the error of my ways and I made a decision, I made a, a, a purpose in my heart, I was going to turn, I was going to go the other direction, I was going to go the other way. That's basically what repentance is. But <clears throat> the, if you would receive the promises, if you would walk in the fullness of the promises, life for you should be a continuous evaluation of, of where you are. In other words, there are promises I didn't have. There are promises that I've received, but I, I didn't get them. They, I didn't get them. Why not? And I need to be repenting of the things that caused me to not get them. Without repentance, I can't change. The other thing about repentance, repentance is a spiritual force. And it's something that was ordained by God. It came from God. And when a person repents, and, and this is in, the, I believe it's in, let me just, let me just turn there and I'll read, I'll read that to you. It's in the Corinthians. I believe it's 2 Corinthians. You have to, I may have to hunt for it a minute here. It's, it's 2 Corinthians 7, I think, is where it is. Yeah, 2 Corinthians chapter 7, verse 9. And this is Paul, he's talking to the Corinthians, and he says, Now I rejoice not that you were made sorrow, but that you sorrowed to repentance. You see, sorrow is not just the, you know, it's, 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 you can be sorry you did something wrong. You can be sorry you made a mistake. You can be sorry you didn't get the, the, the outworking of the, the, the promise that belonged to you. But that doesn't do anything in and of itself. To be sorry doesn't do anything in and of itself. You've got to sorrow to repentance. That's what he says here. Now, for you were made sorry after a godly manner, that you might receive damage by us in nothing. For godly sorrow worketh repentance to salvation, not to be repented of. There are big words in there, but what it means is, that when you saw godly sorrow leads you to repentance, to acknowledgement of the mistake that you made, but it leads you to the correct path and leads you to. And in that process right there, for godly sorrow work of repentance to salvation, not to be repented of, there is a spiritual force in there. There's a push, there's a spiritual force push so that when you do repent when you when you repented of something that you made a mistake or that you just didn't see correctly i tell you sometimes that's you know i just didn't see that right i just didn't see that right you know one of the you know you know we 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 and and i don't make any any apology for this we live in the realm of the supernatural that's who we are we're supernatural people we live in in the realm of the supernatural and many times the difference between functioning in the natural and functioning in the supernatural is just how you saw it. It may not even be what you did, it's just how you saw it, and you, you just missed it. You know, I remember years ago, this, uh, I had a, a very good friend who was, um, he, he, was, he, was, he, was, he was a lifelong friend, he's a very good friend, and he's a very wealthy man. And, um, one day we were talking about this uh, property that that uh, we had bought. That was an, uh, it was a, 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 a it was a foreclosed uh, apartment building, is what it was. And we were able to take that property, make it into a viable property, and make it produce substantial revenue for us. And so I'm talking to my friend about it, and he said, "You know," he said, "Before you ever brought bought that property." Somebody brought it to me and showed it to me. He said, and I looked at it and I thought, there's nothing here. He said, I, did, did, I saw it wrong. I didn't know what I was looking at. I didn't see. Sometimes the difference, and that's, a, that's what you should be, should be your confession. It should be your praying for. I see things through the eyes of the supernatural. 
I see them through the eyes of God. I see them like God sees them. That's the key to functioning in the supernatural, is to be able to see the supernatural element that's in there. And it's not just, you know, because what happens is, and I, you know, I was reading a, uh, uh, I, I was rereading a book that I read years and years ago. And uh, it's, it, was, it was written by a guy who was Donald Trump's lawyer. And, uh, and, and he shepherded Donald, these real estate transactions that Donald Trump did. And, you know, Donald Trump, you know, people who love him or hate him and, you know, they, they you know, got this against him because they see him as a president. Donald Trump was a brilliant real estate man, a truly one of the most brilliant real estate people have ever lived. And he became a billionaire through real estate transactions. That doesn't just happen overnight and it doesn't happen to just anybody. You know, so there was a brilliance in in uh, 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 Donald Trump, but that was what the guy was saying. He said he was able to see through the problems to the solution, and that's one of the keys to the supernatural. You know, is to be able to see through. Everybody can see problems. The gift of the ability to recognize problems is a cheap gift because everybody got it. You know, right, right, right. a gift that everybody got is cheap, and and, and is cheap and probably valueless if everybody got it. You know, it's the gift that not anybody got. It's the gift that you cultivated. It's the gift that you developed. That's the, that's the one, and that's the one God will use for you to prosper. You is the gift that that you picked up and you cultivated and you worked with and you you, you, you developed. And, and it may have been a supernatural gift that you got in the beginning. There may be a seed of that, but you have to develop it and you have to to, uh, to, to make it go. So the reality of, of, of sometimes even repentance, one of the key things of repentance might be just, I didn't see that right. I saw that wrong. I didn't see everything that went with that. I didn't see the necessity to do this, or I didn't see the necessity to do that, and to repent even just sometimes for the way the result. So repentance is one of the master tools in the tool belt, but it should be exercised on a regular basis of God, I just, there are things I didn't see, God, I didn't see that, I made this mistake and I didn't see that, and I repent and I ask you to open my eyes, open my vision. We talked, I think, we talked a couple of weeks ago about some one of the verses in Psalm 119 that says, Open thou my eyes to behold wonderful things out of thy law. You can read that law, you can read it, and you can read it, and you can never see the wonderful things. Because God's got to open your eyes. There's a spiritual open. It's one of the reasons you need the baptism of the Holy Spirit. I will tell you this. Without the baptism of the Holy Spirit, your eyes will never be open to the treasures that are in there. I mean, this book is filled with treasures. It's filled with instruction. It's filled with words. But without the baptism of the Holy Spirit, without the, the, the Holy Spirit helping you to see it, you'll never recognize the treasures that are in there. But there are treasures in this word that you can mine and, 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 and they work for you and not against you. And uh, and yes, you got to read them, and yes, you got to study them. But you need to read them under the inspiration of the Holy Ghost, and you need to invite the Holy Ghost whenever you're studying the Word, whenever you're reading the Word. You want to invite the Holy Ghost with you to open your eyes to behold those wonderful things that are that are that are contained in the law. So once again. Make repentance a tool in your belt that you use all the time. And we, we, we associate this negative connotation, you know, with, with uh, we associate this negative connotation with, with uh, uh, or, or we make a negative connotation of the word repentance. But the truth is, there's nothing negative about it at all. It's, it's engaging the spiritual force to move you forward where perhaps you didn't move forward before, you couldn't move forward before. Now you've engaged this spiritual force to push you, to give you that supernatural push in there. That's yeah, 1 Corinthians 1. 1 Corinthians, uh, it's 2 Corinthians 7, verses 9 through uh, 10. Verses 9 and 10. Mm -hmm. Oh, I, I say that, to eat, because one of the things that I have been thinking about, and and I repent for my part in this, that I have not been engaging the Holy Ghost on behalf of this COVID business in our country. And uh, the reality is 
that had the people of God lined up and begun to pray and begun to engage their faith and begin to exercise their faith over this COVID, it would have been gone years ago. It, it would barely have gotten started had the people risen up. But what happened was that the leadership of our country and the, the, and, and there was a failure, and you know, there, there is a hierarchy of spiritual leadership in this country, whether you like it or not, it's there, you know, and, uh, uh, and, and there are uh, ministers and there are uh, uh, leadership that, that uh, lead large numbers of people, and there was a wholesale failure in the ministry to lead the people to pray and to rebuke that thing and to curse that thing and to have it gone. You can curse it over, you know, it's one thing to curse it over your, your life, and I've done that, I'm not getting COVID, I'm not, you know, I'm not gonna have COVID or any of those kinds of problems, because I've cursed it, I cursed it at the root, and, and, and you know, no plague or calamity is gonna come near my tent. But we in the ministry ought to be praying that that thing, that that thing leaves our country, that it leaves our nation, that it leaves our people, that it be of none effect. And had the people of God risen up properly in the beginning, it would have been gone a long, long time ago. It's not too late to do that, but it's going to require us to repent for having not done it. And it's going to require, it's going to require the, the, uh, uh, you know, the ministry to basically turn and say, God, we're sorry. God, we made a mistake. God, we failed to see that. We failed to see what was our, our responsibility uh, in there. Oh, hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. And I, and like I said, I repent of my part of that, but not really rising up to, 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 to be able to uh, uh, do that. And I've certainly done it over our family and our employees and that sort of thing, but we've not done it over, you know, the, the, the nation as a whole, which, which we, uh, we, we should have done. Uh, Pastor Gail has been, she's, and I invite you to look at this. It's on, uh, she, she's putting it on the Facebook. I'm not sure if they've got it on YouTube yet or not, but I know that it's on our Facebook. She started a series of, uh, in the book of Samuel, and, uh, and, it, and the, it is a fascinating book. It's absolutely a fascinating book because what happens in the book of Samuel, there's a transition that takes place there. And the transition is that Eli has, is a judge. He's a judge and he's been appointed in the judge. And he's a, he's, he's, there's a familial line and it's a bloodline. And, and Eli is just the next in, in, in the bloodline. But Eli wholesale failed in his duty to minister and to raise up his children after him, his two sons uh, after him, who, who uh, uh, were supposed to take over the, uh, the ministry of the temple after him. And he failed, to, he failed to, to exercise judgment. He failed to exercise control over both the temple and the people and over his sons. And what happened was the Lord ended up, and, and the Lord disqualified him, and the Lord said, this is it, you know, you're, you're gone. And the Lord brought in Samuel, who, who was, Samuel was not in the line. Samuel was not uh, in the bloodline. But God chose him, and God's objective was to get away from the Levitical priesthood that had failed and eventually get over to Judah the line of Judah, which is where the Messiah was coming from, because he, you know, God knew that, the, that, that uh, uh, Jesus would come from the line of Judah, uh, from the uh, uh, Messiah, and he had to get it away from the ministry that had failed, and get it over to the one that was going to eternally succeed. Well, I think we're going to see that in the ministry again. I think, what, I think we're seeing that the, the ministry as a whole, and at least in our nation, has become too caught up with, with monetary issues and too caught up with being friendly to the people and too caught up with, with uh, what we use our friendly business and so forth that we don't preach the, the acceptable behavior and the acceptable thoughts before God. And we don't talk about the, your reasonable service before God. Right. And we don't talk about the things that, that you know, that m make us be partakers of the, the heavenly calling and make us be partakers of the heavenly gift. See, the, uh, uh, 2 Peter chapter 4, verse 1, 
says there are exceeding great and precious promises that make you a partaker of the divine nature. We're not talking about those promises. And one of the prom- and one of the things is, see, there's a r- repentance has a promise to it. It's a promise that if you repent and you change, God will get you in the right direction. He'll get you moving in the right direction. So there's a promise that actually goes with that. And so I just, I encourage you to examine your behavior. Examine the things that you do. Examine particularly your thoughts and your thought life, you know. Because, you know, you cannot control thoughts that come into your mind. But you can control whether they stay or not. And you can control whether that be thought engages you in a certain behavior or not. And, you know, one of, one of the things that I learned years ago was that I had to stay off the road to sin, you know, because if I got on the road to sin, I was going to get there really easy. When, when, when you're on the road, you're going to get there, you know. But if you keep yourself away from the road, then you won't get there. And that was something that I discovered that was a, a, was a key, key thing. I remember, you know, I used to, I was addicted to tobacco, and, and I wanted to stop smoking. I had a fit. And I, I heard people that said, you know, uh, well, you know, when I quit smoking, I had a, a carton of cigarettes on my dresser drawer, and I just never smoked again. I couldn't do that, because that was the road to sin. And if I didn't get off that road, if I didn't make sure that my car wasn't going down the road, it, was, it, just, it just didn't happen for me. Everybody's different, you know, and I, and, and I appreciate that. But I would caution you that we all got a road, too, you know, and you've got to make sure that you stay off the road. And, you know, sometimes there's just a, there's a directional signal on the road. You've got to recognize the directional signal. I'm not even going over to the road, you know, let alone go, 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 go down that road. Because the Bible says, but as a man thinketh in his heart, so is he, as he thinks in his heart. Everything originates as a thought. Even repentance originates as a, a thought. But everything originates as a thought. And then it, it emanates from there. Things, think, things go from there. So you've got to control your thinking. If you ever want to function in the realm of the supernatural, you've got to control the way that you think. You've got to, you've got to make your mind think supernaturally. Once again, that's what we were talking about earlier. You repent for not seeing things, for not seeing the things the right way. I want my eyes open to be able to behold wonderful things out of the law. I want my eyes to be able to be able to hold the supernatural element in the things that I'm doing. Because without seeing them, you'll never possess them. You can't, you can't possess what you can't see. You know, what you can't believe for. And you can't believe for what you can't see. You've got to be able to see it and believe for it. Call forth those things that be not as though they are. So you've got to be able to recognize the supernatural element. That doesn't just happen. It just doesn't happen with, uh, with people. But it can happen for you. You make it your confession. You make it your person. You begin to ask God, God, show me the supernatural element. God, I want to walk in the realm of the supernatural. I want to live by the supernatural. Your word said that I'm supposed to walk by faith and not by sight. I need you to help me walk by faith and not by sight. And your word over me said that that uh, the just live by faith. God, I want to live by faith. And I need you to help teach me how to do it. I mean, the Holy Spirit is our teacher. He's our leader. He's our guide. But you know, there's a whole swath of Christianity out there that decided they're not going to receive the baptism of the Holy Spirit. And they're never going to get there because the Holy Spirit is your helper. But it is the engaging the baptism of the Holy Spirit that engages your helper and makes your helper work with you and makes your, makes your helper go. So perhaps you, you, you've heard me say here today that you need the baptism of the Holy Spirit. <laughs> I hope you heard me say that because you do. You need that. Oh, you need that. You, you, you need that. Uh, but anyway, I encourage you to listen to uh, Pastor Gail's uh, sessions on uh, uh, the book of Samuel because it, it is it's truly a, it's all about the heart. It's all about the heart attitude. And what happened was that there were prophet, prophetic people who came to Eli and said, you know, this is what's going to happen to you. You know, and he, and he still didn't act on it, and he, and, he, and he still didn't change. You know, God is about a warning yes. of, of yes. situations that yes. are going to, God is, God is a warner. And, you know, we can push him off and we can, you know, not recognize the, the, the warning.
But I'm telling you, that's, you know, the, the uh, you know, we, we talk about dreams and visions all the time because God deals with us in dreams and visions. And it is a powerful gift that you want if you don't, if you don't have it, or if you're not getting a lot of it, or if you're not getting enough in, in the area of dreams and visions, ask for it. Make a faith demand for it, because it's a gift of, of almost inestimable proportions. It's like such an extraordinary gift. But one of the things he uses dreams for is warnings. We see that in the book, of, in, in, the, in the four Gospels, how Joseph was warned again and again in dreams. You know, there are people that seek the life of the child. Get up and go to Egypt, you know. Uh, go somewhere else. Get up and get up and leave. Go, go somewhere else. And there were times where, you know, there, there, was, there was one dream in particular where, where he's, he's awakened and he got up and left immediately. Now, it doesn't say this, but there's probably a terror in that dream. That's probably what it was. He woke up and left immediately as a, as a result of that. And so, you know, we see pictures in the Bible of warnings in yes. dreams. And, and like I said, we, we had that happen so many times where God would warn us in dreams. And you can look the other way. It's easy to look the other way, too. You know, you've got to develop yourself and receive it and act on the things that God says to you. But it's a, it's a powerful, powerful. Is that alligator dream this week? A dream this week, yeah. About uh, it was a warning dream this week. It was a, a, a warning dream about um, just staying away from something. And we, once again, we've had those happen, you know, again and again and again. And it's easy to, you know, easy to go your way and do the things you want to do. But you know, at the end of the day, what a gift to have the God who sees around the corners of your life that you can. Warn you about situations and say this is not going to go well for you. This is not going to go well if you keep going down that direction and if you don't turn here. If you don't turn, I remember my uh, and I don't think you would mind me mind me telling my oldest son was um, you know my oldest, oldest all my children you know they they all experiment because they're children they all they experiment with alcohol and things like that you know and and he. Uh, uh, was, uh, uh, you know, he was a party animal, you know, and uh, <laughs> it just was a good kid, but he's a party animal. And I had a dream about there being a small snake in the, in, in our, our hallway, you know, and he was there, there's a small snake, and you know, where my children's rooms were, and that there was a small snake in the, uh, in, in the thing there. But when I went to get the snake, it became this giant thing that leaped out and leaped at him, you know. And fortunately, there was a, a, a protective, it was like a board that he was wearing over his uh, uh, chest, and the snake banged off that board. Well, the meaning of the dream was, you think this alcohol business is a small thing, you know. There is not a small thing. It, it seeks your life. It's seeking your life. Yes. And right now, God's got a barrier in there that's protecting. But someday that barrier won't be there anymore. You know. And if you continue to entertain this thing, and 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 He recognized it for what it was and stopped, and He, he does not drink. And um, you know, you guys have heard me me tell this. Probably, if I look at my life, you know, because I, I I don't drink. We haven't drank. 30 years, but um, but I used to, 30 years ago, and every really bad decision that I ever made was made under the influence of alcohol, and uh, it just, it was what it was, you know, and you just had kind of had to come to the place where, where you and Gates and say, God, I need you to help me in this, because I, I, you know, I recognize what you're saying in these dreams, this is a bad thing, you know, and I, you know, I, and I to change. Oh, but God is your helper, and he will help you with those things. And sometimes it might just be a matter of repentance of God. I didn't see that you wanted to help me with this. You know, I didn't see that uh, I could engage the power of the Holy Ghost to help me in this matter, you know. Oh, hallelujah. Well, anyway, I, you know, I don't know how we got over all that stuff today. <laughs> what I was going to talk about and uh, um, and we'll just and, and, and we'll spend just let's just spend a minute on it. it's Mark eleven twenty 
um, 22 through 26 is actually the, and it's, it's, it's faith. He's, he's talking about faith here. He's talking about how faith works. And he's talking about, this is probably the most, uh, one of the most essential uh, discussions or one of the most important discussions of faith in the whole, whole Bible. And Jesus answering and said to them, have faith in God. For verily I say unto you that whosoever shall say unto this mountain, be thou removed, be thou cast into the sea, and shall not doubt in his heart, but shall believe that those things which he saith shall come to pass, he shall have whatsoever he saith. Therefore I say unto you, whatsoever things you desire, when you pray, believe you receive them, and you shall have them. And when you stand praying, forgive, if you have aught against any, that your Father also which is in heaven, may forgive you your trespasses. But if you do not forgive, neither will your Father, which is in heaven, forgive your trespasses. Now, the the passage principally revolves around two things. It revolves around what you believe and what you say. But it's bookended by these two things. One of them have faith in God. In other words, it's not faith in faith, and it's not faith in the fact that the sun's going to rise tomorrow morning. It's not faith in your ability to do things. It's not faith in your ability to see things. It's faith in God. Faith in God. That's what makes faith work is faith in God. Because faith came from God. And what you're doing is the gift of faith that you've got. That's what you're activating. That's what you're working with. And Romans 12, 3 says, God dealt to every man the measure of faith, or every person the measure of faith. And so we got that from God. But it is faith in God and faith in God's ability to make it work for us and faith in God's ability for us to use it. That's what makes faith work. It's faith in God. And then in the end, he talks about forgiveness there. And, and you know, uh, we've talked about that, you know, certainly at length. You, you can't hear that enough, that if you don't forgive other people, the promise, you're, you're shut out of the promises. You're blocked off of the promises if you don't forgive other people. And unforgiveness is one of the most insidious uh, sins that there is. And it will sneak back when you're not looking at it. And it will come back in a different form. And it masquerades as all kinds of things. Sometimes it'll mas- unforgiveness will masquerade as wisdom. Unforgiveness might masquerade as as uh, knowledge. It might masquerade as the better judgment, you know, and, and those kinds of things. And you have to keep an eye out for unforgiveness because if you're in unforgiveness, you're shut off from the promises. That's the deal. The promises just don't work for you anymore, including the promise of protection. And that's because you can open a door. You can leave the door open. I got sick. I got pneumonia one time. And uh, uh, it just violently, violently ill. And, you know, I prayed about it. I said, God, I, I have a covenant. You know, I'm not supposed to get sick. You know, I got a covenant. What's the deal? And the Lord said, well, you were in unforgiveness toward this particular person. It was a, it was a business transaction. And, and he said, uh, uh, it was a business transaction with a guy that went to our church. <laughs> and... Uh, <laughs> And the Lord said, you know, you, you were in unforgiveness toward that person, and you opened the door. And, uh, you know, you got to close the door. And uh, so I did. I repented. I forgave the guy and, you know, got, got, got healed, got, a, got it behind me. But, uh, but what had happened is through allowing unforgiveness, and I hadn't thought about that and meditated. I wasn't, you know, I, I guess I didn't, I, I, wasn't, I didn't even know that I was in unforgiveness. Uh, toward the guy until the Lord pointed it out. But the idea was that it blocked me from that protection over sickness and disease. It blocked me from God's God's covering over because, you know, one of, that's how he protects us from sickness and disease is there's a shield. There's an invisible shield about us, you know. And that shield, there are things that can cause that shield to come down. You know, one of them is unforgiveness will cause that shield to come down. And that's what happened to me in that case. My shield was down because of of, uh, of un- un- unforgiveness. And uh, hallelujah. So the rest of this passage, though, he's talking about you know what you believe and what you say, and it mirrors Romans ten nine and ten that if you believe in your heart and confess with your mouth Jesus is Lord, you shall be saved. For with the heart man believes unto righteousness with the mouth
confession is made unto salvation or confession is made unto the promises. So in other words, with the heart, you believe the promise. You believe that the promise is yours. You believe that, the, that that's how, the, you know, how you get the promise. But with the mouth, you take your possession. You confess it. You take it. You speak it. You receive it with your declaration, with your mouth, with the things that you say. So those two elements, and once again, in the interest of time, we won't turn there, but, but the two scriptures, uh, there is one of them is a man thinketh in his heart, so is he. That has to do with what you think. That has to do with your thought process. Because once again, it has to do with your believer, if you will. Because to believe is a choice. You know, I believe, uh, uh, I believe that this promise belongs to me. I believe this is mine. And I, 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 so I call it in, I pray over it, I begin to speak because I believe that that's mine. There is a place past believing, and it's knowing. And uh, like, for example, in healing, you should come to the place where I don't believe I'm healed anymore. I know I'm healed. I don't believe that I'm entitled to divine healing. I know that I'm entitled to divine I know that he is my healer. I know how he operates. I know he's my provider. I know he takes care of me. I know that he will take care of me. I know that he will provide for me. He'll see over those things. And, and the only way you get to know him is where you believe long enough. You know, when you believe it, uh, you begin to force yourself to believe at a higher level. But then you take possession of it with the words, with the words of your mouth, with the things, because death and life is in the power of the tongue, and they love to believe the fruit thereof. So if you want to birth life to a promise, you've got to be speaking, you've got to be declaring it, you've got to be calling it in, you've got to be, be calling it forth. Now, we, we said this last week and then in, in, in weeks gone by, I'm going to say it again. The tongue is a unique member of the body because it is part of the flesh. It is the, the tongue is part of the flesh, but the tongue is connected to the spirit as well. And you influence both the physical man and the spiritual man with the tongue. See, you know, God said to uh, Adam that he was not to partake of the fruit of a certain tree in the garden. Because he said, if you do partake of that, in the day that you partake of it, that day you shall surely die. But what happened? And so Adam, Adam does. He, he partakes of it. But what happens is he doesn't die physically. He died spiritually that day. He, he died spiritually that day. But he didn't die physically. So there's a difference between physical death and, and spiritual death. And so it's the same with you that you, you, you're, you're exercising spiritual law. You claim the promises with your tongue. But the difference is that you don't want them just in the realm of the spirit. You need them in the realm of the natural. For example, let's say that I'm needing healing. Well, I'm healed in the realm of the spirit all the time. But i got to have it in my body. i got to have my body healed too. The tongue, because it is an instrument of dual a purpose, it grabs it in the realm of the spirit, but it brings it into the realm of the natural. Provision works exactly the same way because you have that two-edged sword there in your mouth, that you have the tongue, you can grab what is in the realm of the spirit and you pull it into the realm of the natural. That's why the tongue has to be involved. In other words, you believe, you believe in the realm of the spirit. There's no problem with that. There's no problem with believing things out there. But you got to get them. And you got to get them into the realm where they're going to do you some good. It doesn't do you any good. If, 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 if Jesus was, uh, uh, he, if he became rich, they, he, I'm sorry, if he became poor, that you could be rich. And that was all in the realm of the spirit. And you couldn't get it from the realm of the spirit to the natural. What would it matter to you? It wouldn't make any difference. It wouldn't help that, you know, he, he became poor. That you could be rich in the realm of the spirit. Well, sometimes you need money here. You know, you need it in this, and you need you need riches, whatever those riches might happen to be. You need them in this realm, and you got to get them from that realm to this realm. And the tongue is the instrument of choice. That it was instrument of God's choice, not your choice. Instrument of God's choice to get that thing over there in the realm of the spirit and bring it into the realm of the natural. Oh, hallelujah. I don't pretend to know how that works, you know, that, or that we would know how that works, but it does. And 
that, and that's exactly how it, 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 uh, it works. You know, God gave Abraham a promise. God said to Abraham, you know, you're going to have a child. And, and what happened is, Abraham, and this is uh, around Genesis chapter 15 or 16, uh, what happened is that, that, you know, God says to Abraham, he says, look, I'm your shield, I'm your exceeding great reward. And that's, that's a wonderful thing, and Abraham's happy about that. But he says, you've given me no seed. There's no seed. And so God begins, God gives him a seed. But it's not a natural seed. It's a spiritual seed. And he has that promise for 25 years before it ever comes to pass. But the thing that made the promise come to pass was when God changed Abraham's name, all of a sudden, he changed his name from Ab- Abram to Abraham. And the uh, name Abraham meant father of many nations. And all of a sudden, within a year of people calling him father of many nations, and him calling himself father of many nations, and saying father of many nations all day long, every single day, within a year of that, all of a sudden, he has the promise. Now yeah. it takes takes begins to take possession of the promise, and it'll work the same way for you too. You can have a promise. You can meditate the promise all you want, but if you don't begin to speak it, if it's not released into the atmosphere, it's if it's not released into your atmosphere. Then what happens is you've not taken possession of the promise. That's what you have to do. You know, we have in Second Peter chapter one verse four, exceeding great and precious promises that we'd be partakers of the divine nature. But you have to get them. You have to possess them. You have to make them yours. And the way you make them yours is by speaking them, by claiming them, by, by uh, you know, we're, we're in the real estate business. And what we do, the first step in acquiring a property is to speak to it and to call it in and to label it and name it. Yes. But you see, the power to, the power to name is is a power of dominion. In other words, if you have a dominion, you have the right to name something if you have dominion over that. For example, my dog, you know, I get a dog. I, I got the right to name my dog because my dog, I got a cat. I got the right to name my cat because I have dominion over the cat. Well, the same way over property. You are mine. You are Kevin's property. You're whatever, whatever it has to be. You're my property. And I call you mine, and I see my name on the deed, and you belong to me. It works that way with everything, not just not just real estate, but but uh, you know God is in the real estate business, and that's one of the reasons we went into that business. Is God's in the real estate business, <laughs> and, and it's an eternal business for Him too, which is a, it's a great thing. You know, the earth is the Lord's and the fullness thereof. Hallelujah! But the dominion. He has given to the children of men. And uh, so that's what he gave us. He gave us dominion. And I want to take my dominion. The earth may be the Lord's, but I want the dominion over it. I want to have the opportunity to, to, to work on it. So we begin that process by speaking to it and by calling it in and by naming it or whatever it is, you know. But, but it begins with the tongue. You engage the tongue. You believe that's yours. I mean, Sometimes you got to engage the tongue even before you believe something because you got to find out if that's what God has for you or not. Everything that your eyes behold is not what God has for you. But you want what God wants for you. You want what God has for you because you want God to partner with you in the things of life. And uh, whether you're in the real estate business, whether you're in the ministry, uh, whether you're, you're called to a particular place or you're called to a particular group of people, uh, you know, you, you maybe you, you you know maybe you you're not sure where you're supposed to live, or you're not sure where you're supposed to uh, work, you know, or or any of those kinds of things. You begin to speak to it. God shows me where I'm supposed to work. God shows me where I'm supposed to live. God leads me. God is geographical, and uh, He'll show you where you're supposed to be and the things that you're supposed to be, uh, the things that you're supposed to be doing. But the mouth is engaged in that. It's a kiki death and life is in the power of the tongue. And once again, it's because that instrument works in both realms. That instrument works in both realms. That you can get a hold of things in the spirit realm and call it in. 
The healing power of God, God healed me. The healing power of God belongs to me. There's new parts for me in, in the realm of the Spirit, and I call them in. I take possession of a new part. You know, if I need a new part for my heart, or I need a new part for my whatever my body happens to be, a, a valve that doesn't work right, or wh whatever it is, God, I call those parts in. I claim them in the realm of the Spirit, and I bring them in. And I thank you, and I give you permission to replace whatever is wrong in my body with whatever is right. And I call it in from the, the, the realm of the Spirit. What you do is you get your mouth involved. It is the key to the supernatural. It's the key to walking in the realm of the supernatural. And we had years, you know, a number of years ago, we had a series of dreams where God spoke to us about learning to speak correctly. Learning to govern your speech, to say the right things, to say the, the uh, things. And like for me, you know, like if I have a dream, and if I have a dream, and in the dream I'm smoking, that means I'm, I'm saying the wrong things. I'm not saying the right things. That's the picture that God uses in the dream for me. So he'll give me a dream that you're talking about something and you're smoking, you know, meaning you got to change your, you got to change your confession. You got to change the things that you're saying. You got to begin to make. And so the idea is that, that you've got to change your speech the way you speak. Uh, now, the Apostle Paul says in uh, Philippians uh, chapter 4, verse 11, he says, Do not speak, or I refuse to speak in respect of want. I refuse to speak in respect of lack. That is a key to supernatural prosperity. It is a key to God supernaturally bringing you the provision that you need. You refuse to speak about what you don't have. You talk about what you do have. You refuse to speak about lack. You talk about abundance. You talk about God's ability to provide. You need to know more about the provider than you do about the lack of provision. So you talk about the provider. You need to know more about how he provides. It's the same way with sickness and disease. You don't need to know all the nuances of how the sickness and disease work. What you need to know is the healer. Who is the healer and how does he work and how does he do what he does? That's what I need to know. And that's who I talk about. I talk about the healer. I talk about his ability to heal me. I talk about how he heals, the ways that he, you know, he sent his word and he healed me and delivered me from any destruction. He bore my sicknesses and carried my diseases. I talk about the healer. I get to know the healer. I need to know more about the healer than I know about the disease. That's a, it's a, 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 a key, key thing. And, you know, to, 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 it, it's certainly true that you need to know things about the disease because sometimes your you know, symptoms are aggravated or, or you can make them worse or those kinds of things. I appreciate that, that you need to know those things, but you need to know more about the healer than you, need, than, than you know about sickness and disease. Hallelujah. But once again, it is the tongue that is connected to both realms. It's the tongue that you use. And so you need to work on how do I speak? What are the things that I say? What do I, you know, what, 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 what do I speak? One of the things is, you know, we're, we, you know, you come into his presence with thanksgiving and into his courts with praise. Be thankful unto him and bless his name for the Lord is good and his mercies endure forever. In other words, you, you, you praise. You speak thanksgiving. You speak praise. I'm thankful to God for the things that he did. I praise him for who he is. I praise him that he's my healer. I praise him that he's my provider. I praise him that he sends things to me. I, that's how I speak. That's how I get into his presence. Because if you get into his presence, it's a whole lot easier to get what you want when you're on the inside than it is when you're on the outside. When you're on the outside, you're not going to get it. But when you get on the inside, you can get the things that you're believing for. And you get on the inside when you follow his protocol. And his protocol has to do with what is going before you. Think of it this way. Think of it in the Old Covenant. You're walking into the temple. And your words are going before you. What words are going before you? You know, if they're words of lack, if they're words of sickness and disease, they're words of disobedience, they're not going to let you in. You know, it's got to be words of praise, words of honor, words of thanksgiving, words of faith and confidence in the promises that you're, you know, I believe those promises are going to receive those promises. 
Well, hallelujah. Anyway, thank you. So I, I want to get, once again, I just encourage you in the, in the, uh, in the issue of the tongue, you know, and the issue of the things that you, you talk about, because once again, it is connected to the flesh, but it's connected to the spirit as well. And it's the instrument that you use to, to take possession of the promises. It's the most important thing, if you're going to walk by faith, if you're going to live by faith, the most important thing is learning to speak correctly. Learning to govern your speech. Right? Now, I, one other thing I'll, I'll, I'll make a note is, is a number of years ago, Pastor Gail and I, we were fasting about a particular situation. And, and after the fast was done, the Lord spoke to me and the Lord said, you know, this ability to fast or this fasting is a tool and it's a weapon but you don't know how to use it and he said you 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 know you've got if you're going to make weapons work for you you've got to learn how to use them and he said you're never going to get good at fasting and using fasting as a weapon unless you do it on a more regular basis so we began to do it we began fasting much more regularly and we particularly on on we would fast every sunday we still do and um, what what the the idea being that you know by through practice you get better at it. You learn more about what you're doing. The thing that I never saw coming was the fact that you that that in the practice of fasting you would be able to discipline your tongue. It would help you learn how to discipline your tongue because fasting is about the discipline of the flesh, and the tongue when the tongue is loose. It's part of the flesh. When the tongue is going in the wrong direction, it's speaking of the flesh. You know, do not be deceived. God is not mocked. Whatsoever man sows, that shall he reap. He that sowed to the flesh, shall the flesh reap corruption. He that sowed to the spirit, shall the spirit reap life. Your tongue is sowing all day long, every day. The question is, what direction is it sowing in? You can be sowing to the flesh in, w- w- with your tongue, or you can be sowing. And what I, I had no idea that that the fasting would help so dramatically in the ability to discipline the tongue. And for me, it wasn't just about, you know, discipline for your family or, you know, your marriage or your family or any of those kinds of things. It was about discipline for business. Keep your mouth shut. You know, there's so many times where I have been so thankful I kept my mouth shut. You know, or I was so thankful I just didn't open my mouth, you know. And uh, uh, fasting was an incredible discipline for that, to help me learn to keep my mouth shut. Because I was one of those guys, I, I like to just pop it off, you know. I like to respond immediately, you know, to, uh, to whatever situation, or, you know, come back with a witty response or a witty, witty thing. But what I found was learning to keep my mouth shut helped so Unbelievable. It's helped me not look like an idiot a lot of times, too, because there are times where I realize if I'd said what I was thinking about saying, I would have looked like an idiot in that, in that case. <laughs> oh, hallelujah. <clears throat> well, anyway, faith. Without faith, it's impossible to please God. So you need to learn how it works. You need to learn how to use it. You need to develop it. You need to work it. Because without faith, it's impossible to please God. Hallelujah. Father, we just thank you. We bless you, Lord God. We praise you. Now, you know, sowing is, is like the tongue, you know, because the tongue, think of it this way. The tongue, there's a, you have your instrument. You have the instrument that can be used as an instrument of the flesh or an instrument of the spirit. It grabs things from the spirit. What happens with seed? What happens when you sow? And we're not just talking about monetary seed. We're talking about all kinds of seed now. When you sow, you're taking that seed, you're taking whatever it is that you have, and you are sticking it through a veil. You're sticking it through the veil of eternity. That's what you want to do with your seed, is you stick it through the veil of eternity, where God can do something with it on the other side, that you don't know what it is, that you don't know what he did with it, you don't know how he did it. All you knew is you get it returned back in the form that you'd like to see it in you get it returned back in the form of, of, of a harvest. That's why it is so critical to ask God, and particularly if you're believing God for something. And I mean, he does everything by seed time and harvest. If there's something you're believing God for, 
God, I'm going to sell. What would you have me to sell? What would you have me to sell? The directed seed, the seed that God said to sow, carries with it a power to produce the supernatural, the realm of the supernatural. No, and, and, and once again, I'm not saying it's not possible that you can, could, could you decide what seed you want to sow, and you sow it and you see God move supernaturally for you and see God move in the realm of the supernatural. It doesn't work for us that way. The way it works for us is, God, what do you want me to sow? And when we know what God wants us to sow, when you stick that seed through the veil of eternity, it's what God wanted to work with. It's the thing that God wanted to take and wanted Thank to you, deal Lord. with. It's the thing. Thank that, you, Lord. you know, I don't know why that was what he wanted. Sometimes we don't know. That's, that's, that's why he wanted. But when you do what he said to do, the chances of it being returned supernaturally are exponentially. So, Father, so so I just encourage you, you know, ask God, God, what do you have me so? What do you have me so? Every day. Because it's not just about money, but it might be about your speech. It might be about the places Thank you go. It might be about the Thank things you, you do. The, the, you, the, the, the friendship you offer to other people. The assistance you offer to other people. All those things are seeds. And you want to know what God has for Thank you, you to sow. Thank you. Because that's where the promise is. Thank you. That's where the supernatural Thank is. You. That's where the incredible supernatural blessing is in the thing that God said to do. Oh, hallelujah. So, Father, we just thank God. Thank you for speaking to us about the things you want for us to do. I just thank you. And sometimes it also can be the thing you're not supposed to do, you know, because we all have a tendency, I'm going to jump off and I'm going to do this, or I'll decide I'm going to do that. It might not be what God has for you to do at all. So you want to get the, you want to make sure you got the Word of God if you're supposed to do something, because maybe that's not what He has for you to do at all. You can get in God's way, and I will tell you this: that the more prosperous you are, the easier it is to get in God's way. And uh, so I, you know, I, I don't know. I'm not God, and I don't know exactly how God thinks about all those things. But if you regularly got in God's way because you were very prosperous. He might see to it that you're not going to be quite so prosperous. You know? <laughs> so I want to make sure that I'm checking with him on my, my sewing. And hey, we've been guilty of not doing that. We've been guilty of getting in God's way from time to time. But we repented. And, uh, and God, we're not, we're, we are going to stay out of your way. And we'll do what you say to do. But we're not going to make decisions about things we're going to do if you're not in it. Oh, hallelujah. Father, we just thank you. As we bring our tithes and offerings today. Your word said that you open the windows of heaven over us, that you pour us out blessings we have not room enough to receive, and the devourer is rebuked for thank our sins. I thank you for that now in Jesus' name. Hallelujah. Amen. Yes, well, yes one, thing, one thing. Okay. How, uh, as Pastor Sokari Mabre Beshiga, we just thank you, Lord. Uh, when we were in famine, when we went through the time of famine, we wrote down a list of things that we learned when we had nothing. When, when, the, when the, the money was gone and we had to relearn and we had to live totally by faith and God had to meet us supernaturally every day. Well, as God is now bringing back finances we know that we still have to walk by faith and believe God. Even though we can pay for the things, we have the finances to pay, we have to keep ourselves active, our faith active in believing God. And so this week as we prayed, we had our prayer meeting on Monday. And those of you that were on for, you know, you can only be on as much as you can be on. But one of the scriptures was Isaiah 45 that says he was going to give us the treasures of darkness and hidden riches in secret places. So that was, as we are praying in the Holy Spirit, I'm writing down the scriptures because I'm believing God to do those things. And in this hour, the, the, the reaper is actually, the Bible says, the reaper is going to overtake the sower. That means you don't even have it totally out of your mouth and it's already harvesting. You're already seeing it, right? 
And so this week we went over, there were some things that I was desiring and I've been calling on. And, and, and I had been looking in the natural. And I remember leaving this place thinking, saying to myself, there, the Lord said, you know, there's not anything supernatural in this. Even though I had the money to buy this thing, it was not supernatural. And so I put that aside and I said, Lord, okay, you're going to do this for me supernaturally. Because when God furnished our home, that God supernaturally told us how to get the home. When he got us into the home, he brought the things that I desired into that home by my faith. Okay? He brought the, the dining room specific dining room table and chairs that I desired because I was specific what I wanted and Kevin could care less about what tables and chairs but I wanted something and God met me and God brought it to us right around the corner for a lot less he brought the sofa the whole living room set to me and the, it was divinely set up for me and ordered for me and and, and we got that and, and so in the last season, we had the money and I didn't believe for the dining room set as much, you know, but we got a whole, the furniture was supernatural. Now there's time, it's time for us to refresh things and God is doing it supernatural. And so um, I just want, he's with you. I turn this off. Hallelujah. Hey. Uh, he's with you in uh in those things that are important to you. And so it might not be that it's a, a real estate property. It might not be that it's, it, it's that thing for you. But God is just as concerned about those things that you desire. And that he wants you, he wants to be in it. So that you can see that God's in it with you. Amen. And so I encourage you, get your faith out there for the supernatural for God to supernaturally bring you a relationship, uh, he does everything out of relationship. Everything out of relationship. And so look at the relationships that you have, because he wants to do and he'll bring new relationships for a new season. Amen? And so, but we saw the supernatural. So he had hidden riches for me in secret places that I found this week. Amen? Hallelujah. Now, I could have, we could have spent all that money over there. But God had hidden riches for me in secret places. And he'll do it for you. Amen. So we prayed that on Monday. And by Friday, the hidden riches were in our, our place. Hallelujah. Amen. And so I, where's your faith? Don't, don't be dislocated. Don't think that your faith isn't anything because you're not believing for real estate or for a million dollars or $10 million. Where at whatever you desire when you pray, believe that you receive them and you will have them. Amen. Thank you for being with us. We will see you tomorrow morning. God bless. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. I see you. Got it in the trail. Hallelujah. 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 Thank you.